Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to Brookings. Buenas tardes a todo y bienvenidos a Brookings. My name is Ted Pacone. I'm the acting vice president and director of the foreign policy program here. And on behalf of John Thornton, who's with us here today, co-chair of the Brookings Institution's Board of Trustees, and our president, Strobe Talbot, I'm delighted to welcome all of you here to Brookings this afternoon for a special address by Michel Bachelet, President of the Republic of Chile. We're very honored that she was able to take time out of her busy schedule here in Washington, including her, her meeting with President Obama at the White House earlier today for the Foreign Policy Program's Allen and Jane Batkin International Leaders Forum. I also want to extend a warm welcome to President Bachelet's high-level delegation from Santiago, including many ministers, members of Chile's Congress, and private sector leaders. We're especially happy to welcome back to Brookings Foreign Minister Eraldo Munoz, who back in 1977 spent a year with us here at Brookings as a visiting fellow finishing up his PhD. President Bachelet is no stranger to our halls either. She joined us in 2009 for a talk from this podium on how Latin America was coping with the global financial crisis. And Washington is familiar ground as well from her early days as a junior high school student in Bethesda and her studies at the Inter-American Defense College to her many visits as Chile's Minister of Defense, Minister of Health, and president from 2006 to 2010. President Bachelet joins us today as she enters her second tour as president of the Republic after winning over 62% of the vote in Chile's national elections last December. With a majority of seats in Congress held by her Nueva Mayoría coalition, President Bachelet has moved quickly to enact an ambitious agenda of reforms most notably in the areas of education, taxes, and constitutional and electoral design. This agenda reflects Chile's remarkable success as a leader in both economic and political terms and its determination to continue moving forward on the path of social and democratic progress. President Bachelet also enters office at an important moment for Latin America which in addition to dominating the World Cup competition so far, <laughs> is facing its own challenges as it pursues more equitable development, greater integration, sustainable energy, and democratic stability. I can think of no other leader in modern Latin America more prepared to take on these challenges than President Bachelet, whose remarkable career as a medical doctor an imprisoned and exiled political activist, a global leader in the fight for gender equality and empowerment as the head of UN Women, and now a two-term president, makes us all proud of the promise of democracy to deliver real results. President, we look forward to your remarks. We will then have time for a discussion moderated by Harold Chincunas, the director of our Latin America Initiative, and including some questions from the audience. If you are following us on Twitter, please use the hashtag Bachelet. Welcome, President Bachelet. Thank you, Ted, for those kind remarks. And particularly, thank you for being there with us, uh, watching uh, the football uh, game to suffering as we suffer. Thank you very much for that. Well, I want to um, say, uh, Chairman of the Board of Brookings Institution, Mr. John Thornton, Acting Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy of the Brookings Institution, Mr. Ted Piconel, Director of Latin American Initiative of the Brookings Institution, Mr. Harold Chincunes. Sec I don't know, Secretary General of the OAS, uh, Your His Excellency Jose Miguel Insulza, ministers, senators, and congressmen, and members of the Chilean delegation, distinguished ambassadors and representatives of the diplomatic corps, officers and representatives of the US government, professors and members of the academia, ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends, because I see a lot of good friends here. I started this to give a little of Latin American touch 
we usually start our speeches with a long mention of all the important people. So dear friends, um, it's always a pleasure to return to the United States, which was my home for several years, a home where I learned important lessons and made close friendships. I thank Brookings and the institution that have co-sponsored this meeting. I'm returning to Washington as president of the Republic of Chile, optimistic that we have initiated positive changes for the future of the country and confident that this is a worthwhile task. In recent decades, Chile has embarked on a successful path of democratic changes. We have significantly reduced poverty and have also strengthened the country's stability, economic, political, and social. We are internationally recognized as a country with good practices, clear rules, and working, and I would say sound, institutions. This has given us a solid anchor in the fluctuations of the globalized world. In other words, ours is a steadfast stability, ours is a steady growth. And the basis for this has been the stability of our domestic, social, political, and economic relations. Above all, above all, our governance is based on identifying and addressing those issues which will lead to a more equal society and dynamic development. Today, the challenge facing Chile is the elimination of inequality dealing with this will enable us to achieve inclusive and sustainable development and to be counted among the most modern developed democracy. And we take up this challenge, not only because it is the right thing to do, but also because it is the most intelligent and reliable way of banking on our future with economic dynamism, political stability, and social cohesion. This challenge requires us to deal with three essential aspects. Tackling inequality understood as disparity of opportunity, lack of access or discrimination and injustice among citizens. Second, encouraging harmonious, sustainable and inclusive growth. And third, achieving greater civic participation in decisions affecting all Chileans. In other words, we're not talking about rewriting, but rather about consolidating our history of development and democracy making improvements and, and changes where shortcomings still exist. And this is not only my idea or that of the people who voted for me. It is a national consensus built up over years. Although there are legitimate differences regarding the best ways of achieving the transformation, and this is what we have launched, a broad national debate, nobody in Chile denies the need for change. Because as in most nations of the planet, Society itself has changed a great deal in recent years. Citizens have become more active, more critical, better informed, and more demanding, if I would say also more challenging. Millions of voices in a multitude of languages are calling for societies not to forget in their institutional dealings, in their economic management, and in the design of their public policies, what should be the focus of any social contract, the people. Although from the government's viewpoint, this demand represents a challenge, it is an interesting and important one. The challenge of ensuring that people are more involved in decision making on matters that affect them, so that development policies are translated into quality of life, social cohesion, and democracy. For us, this means reappraising collective life and public interest, promoting dialogue with a civic sense and a respect for differences. The challenge of eliminating inequalities has an ethical component, since it refers to a good life for all, but it also has an economic component. That's why we're saying it's the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do. Because we know that we need dynamic and sustained economic growth in order to tackle inequality, eradicate poverty, create opportunities for development, and generate revenue for in the implementation of social welfare policies. And so it is in both senses that Chile has decided to assume and expand the undeniable progress made by the country since the return of democracy, recognizing today's new challenges and focusing on governance for growth and on stability of democracy. Around 2020, Chile will have achieved a per capita income similar to that of the developed economies. But we shall not be a truly developed country if we continue to be one of the OECD countries with the highest income inequality. 
And this inequality affects our social cohesion and our prospects for economic development. This is why we must tackle it decisively and at the same time opt for inclusion and growth. Like most Chileans, I'm convinced that the biggest risk to the stability and progress of Chile is not making the changes that we need to make. Because inequality undermines one of the most important foundations both of the economy and of democracy, trust. Trust in the markets, trust in institutions and their stability, trust in social relations. And trust is a precious asset which today Chile has to decide to enhance reducing inequality and fostering cooperation between the state, the citizenry, and the market. And this is the underlying meaning of the reforms. And we are optimistic because this is the best way of building a better country for all. We have a strong foundation on which to build. In recent years, Chile's economic growth has been positive and unemployment has declined. This allowed important progress to be made in the expansion of social rights and opportunities for people. This reflects the global financial scenario, good copper prices, and recent years, in, sorry, good copper prices in recent years, and our monetary and fiscal response to the financial crisis. These conditions are cyclical and difficult to replicate. When the factors underlying the dynamism of our economy disappear, growth prospects will recede. Chile is currently experiencing a period of low growth below its GDP potential, and we must respond to the challenge with which this represents. Chile's growth for 2014 is estimated at just over 3%. Starting in 2015, our goal is to resume the steady path of growth, and in the second half of our administration, for Chile's growth to be, to be about 5% as at its potential GDP level. We have set ourselves ambitious goals, but we are taking a realistic approach to this economic condition facing us. We need to generate more economic growth, but not growth of any kind. We need growth that is socially legitimate and inclusive, environmentally sustainable and democratically oriented. For this, we need to broaden the basis of our development by means of structural reforms. Chilean society, the citizenry and our economy indicate that now is the time to undertake such reforms. What are the changes that we are proposing on and that are already underway. One, a structural reform of education, focusing on quality, public education, and inclusion. Two, stimulation of economic growth and productivity, innovation, and competitiveness. And this obviously involves also tackling the challenges facing us regards energy. Three, tax reform, providing ongoing resources for the state and redistributing more equitably the efforts of common development. It must also lead us back to the path of fiscal responsibility, which is essential if the state is to honor its commitments in the medium and long term. Four, a new constitution, an up-to-date one, allowing more scope for democracy, participation, and guarantees for people in all their diversity. I should like to refer briefly to all these topics. Firstly, education which fosters equity, productivity, and democracy. I'm not gonna say anything that will, I will win a Nobel Prize here, but knowledge is essential in order to achieve ongoing prosperity in all these areas. And to generate this knowledge, countries must make education the focus of their development strategy. This is what, we, what countries have done. Those countries who have achieved development, such as Finland or Japan, Singapore, or the United Kingdom. Chile needs and loudly demands far-reaching change to improve the quality, scope, and coverage of education at all levels. We, you will undoubtedly recall hearing the news three years ago that thousands of students in Santiago issued a structural demand, the right to free and quality education. That was a time when a lot of young people were street all over the world. But something that I was here in the UN, uh, working for the UN, and everybody would ask me in any meeting, how could you explain this? Because we understand that in countries who are doing bad in the economy, but you're doing well in the economy. How you explain that doing well in the economy because still people are demonstrating massively on the street? I have to tell you that the demand that those students were posing was echoed throughout the society, anxious to ensure that all children and young people are given not only basic education, but also appropriate standards of quality over and above what a family can pay. And Chile has 
And I have to tell you, when a country is so, if I would say, proud of what we have been able to build, coming from a dictatorship to build a sustainable, mature democracy with good economic performance, well, people believe now it's our time. We, 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 we really deserve to have quality education for all. Chile has an important task here. Today, we are the OECD country ranked as being most dependent on private funding for its higher education, exactly 85.4%. In Korea, Japan, and the United Kingdom, the reliance on family contributions is considerable, but much less than in Chile. More state investment in education is therefore crucial for a society aiming at equitable and sustainable development. I know this is also discussion here in the United States about education and, and, and how, how and, the, and the depth that the students are having right now. Well, Chile must, Chile must remedy the shortcomings of the system system and provide guarantees of the principles underlying our right to education, that is integration, universality, and quality. So this is why we have initiated the structural reform which is already underway. And our proposals concern various aspects, improving of public education, an end to discriminatory selection of students, an end to profit making by establishing receiving public funds, and an end to co-payment by parents in institutions with mixed financing. In other words, we want families not to have to pay for their children's education in establishment receiving state funding. Second, creation of two new state universities. They will be created in two regions of the country where, where there is no public um, as university. Of, um. And third, institution building and improved coverage of preschool education. In addition, we are guaranteeing access to college for the most vulnerable students through a special program of access to higher education. And we're improving technical education throughout Chile under the auspices of regional universities and with education projects reflecting the economic and productive characteristic of each territory. What is our goal? Our goal is to guarantee that all students in Chile, without exception, can obtain quality education free of charge. What we really want is not to lose any of those talents, capacities that our people have and they're not distributed according to the income of the family. So we need everyone to be, have the opportunity of a good education and then uh, to contribute to the country's development. Private providers of education may continue to participate if they meet quality standards, ban all forms of discrimination, and assume the responsibility of the, in, of the obligations incumbent of a public service. Of course, the state must play the leading role in both the delivery and regulation of education. This would produce better informed citizens, promote social mobility, equity and inclusion, and allow Chile's growth to depend not only on its natural resources, but also on the knowledge of its people. And this brings me to another focus of my government, development of production and competitiveness. We know that productivity increases slowly in Chile. And we also know that innovation is the main trigger of long-term growth. We must therefore add, add more knowledge, more complexity, and more innovation to our economy, and also involve those who are not participating today or are participating below their potential. We must also diversify our production matrix. In addition to the exploitation of our natural resources, and particularly copper, other production sectors must contribute relatively more to the generation of wealth and economic growth. In order for this to happen, manpower training is essential. Accordingly, we have set in motion initiatives to expand the coverage, the contribution to productivity, and the relevance of training for work. Through specialized and targeted plans, we are making special efforts to generate suitable incentives to increase the participation of women and young people in the world of work. In Chile, these two groups have the lowest rates of participation in the labor market, 54.6% for women and 37.1% for young people. These figures are respectively 7.7 and 10.3 percentage points below the OECD average. In addition to, to investment in human capital, we shall increase investment in science, technology, and innovation, offering incentives for their application to the solution of the country's problems. We must implement a strategy that takes into account 
the conditions, strengths, and needs of our country. A strategy based on research and innovation in which public-private initiative is essential. In this context, we have announced two powerful programs that go to the heart of the economic activity, the Agenda for Productivity, Innovation, and Growth, and the Agenda for Energy. The Agenda for Productivity, Innovation, and Growth focuses the development strategy for diversification of the production matrix, inclusion of more people in the labor market, incorporation of new economic sectors in our basket of export, stimulus of our strategic areas, support for small and medium-sized enterprises, and creation of quality public infrastructure. This extensive agenda includes a series of measures to which the experience of the United States will be very useful to us. For example, this agenda envisages a na national network of business development center, which will provide comprehensive advice to help small and medium enterprises to improve their business models. And I know that you have small business development centers, which are our inspiration, I have to say. Then you can ask the copyright, but now we have, we're gonna copy it. Um, well, we just signed an MOU with the government, so don't worry. Um, which, uh, as I said, your small business development center are our inspiration, and we are already cooperating in connection with this project. Well, I'm not gonna discuss, describe the whole agenda. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty big, it's lengthy, and available to the public. But I do want to add that we shall also have a system of cluster to support the productive diversification of our economy and the expansion and strengthening of the sectors already consolidated. Through those actions, we shall finance public goods to buttress significant investment projects with a focus on sectors with high potential for growth and job creation. However, while setting new productivity targets, we're also aware that Chile faces considerable energy challenges. Chile imports 60% of its primary energy. This means that our country is sensitive to price instability and volatility in the international markets to supply restrictions. We must invest in infrastructure and new generation and transmission projects in order to reduce this dependency. This has not been happening in recent years. And this means that we have not incorporated basic energy that we can use to guarantee a reliable supply in the short and medium term. We are aware of the urgent need to encourage projects to reduce the energy deficit, and we have said that we shall strongly support all initiatives that comply with the rules in force and are a good fit in our regions. In this area, too, the state and the private sector must work together. And this is a key point, because one of the obstacles to the sector's growth is the lack of social permits for those projects. There are import two important challenges here. To strengthen the energy institutional structure and to work to reconcile the interest of local communities with those of the energy generation and transmission projects. This means work at an early stage, following clear rules to ensure the development of these projects is feasible in the medium and long term. We are therefore working on a plan of territorial development allowing us to decide which projects can be located and where. We want to see it all stakeholders in, in together to uh, define sort of an area development so we can get into some agreements on this. However, we also face the challenge of improving competition in the energy market and encouraging new players to enter the market. On this visit, we hope to be able to study the experience of the United States from which we have much to learn about gas distribution, renewable, non-conventional energies, energy efficiency, and good practices. And I want to stress this. It is urgent for Chile to ensure reliable and efficient energy development at competitive prices, but at the same time, to use our renewable resources in a sustainable and non-polluting manner. This is the meaning of our energy agenda, ensuring that the country will have a diversified, balanced, and sustainable energy matrix. We aim to reduce energy prices, ensuring greater competition, efficiency, and diversification in the energy market. We shall ensure that 45% of the electricity generation capacity that we install between 2014 and 2025 comes from renewable, non-conventional energy resources, so that this accounts for 20% of Chile's energy matrix within a decade. In addition, we have proposed that energy efficiency 
should be a state policy, the rule rather than the exception. Our goal is for us to be able to reduce our consumption by 20% by 2025. We're talking of a total of 20,000 gigawatts per year. And I know that here too you have much to teach us since the Energy Policy Act of 2005 attaches great importance to efficiency. Ultimately, the goal of this agenda is to give certainty to all relevant players, to increase predictability, to reassure communities, and to introduce clarity into the rules for investors. Dear friends, I know that this is an extensive program of change. However, the point is that Chileans want to implement it while preserving the growth and democracy governments that we have built with considerable effort. Consequently, our fiscal policy will continue to be guided by the policy of structural balance because the commitment of new ongoing expenditure must always be linked to ongoing revenue. This is the first responsibility of state towards people. For this reason, in view of the need to undertake a structural reform of education and other social welfare requirements, we shall be implementing a tax reform that will give the state the necessary revenue on a sustainable basis equivalent to 3% of GDP. In addition to providing ongoing revenue, the goal of the reform is also to improve income distribution and tax equity. In Chile, we have a sad paradox. The gap, the gap between the income of the richest and the poorest households is not reduced after payment of taxes. And this is a problem that we must solve as a country. Under this reform, currently going through Congress, those with the highest, highest income must take, make a greater effort to contribute to public revenue. And this is a well-structured reform with well-designed incentive to be introduced gradually. Some have tried to describe this reform as anti-growth. I should like to say that when the developed countries had a per capita income similar to that of Chile today, most of them had tax burdens considerably higher than Chile's and tax systems that helped to redistribute income. Those countries developed as they collected higher taxes and provide their citizens with a much higher standard of living. Chile has room for improvement as regards taxation. In 2010, Chile's tax burden was 18.4% and the average was 20.6% for OECD countries, which at that time had a per capita GDP similar to that of Chile. There is no reason why Chile cannot follow the same path. The tax reform that I have described may not please everyone. It doesn't please anyone, I have to say. You don't have to, but I know. <laughs> but it's essential if we are to tackle the inequalities and continue to develop. It should be noted that the expected effect of uh, the higher taxation on public saving and training of human capital will be more than offset the short-term effects on investment. Moreover, the income tax increase will have little or no effect on investment. Chile is an active player in international financial markets with a low level of risk. Thanks to our macroeconomic policies and fiscal soundness, we have a low risk classification at the global level and are the economy with the lowest risk in Latin America. We have no reason to fear that a tax reform earmark for investment in human capital will alter our economic development course. Taxation is only one of the factors affecting investment and is far from being the most important one. Studies on the subject conclude that the most important factors for investment are, first, social cohesion and political stability. Second, the quality and credibility of public institutions. Third, the accessibility and competitiveness of markets, including financial markets. Four, infrastructure, and five, appropriate economic legislation. All, and in all these areas, we are meeting our challenges. I shall not describe in detail all the tax reforms, but I do wish to say that they have four goals. The first is to increase the tax burden in order to finance ongoing expenditure with ongoing revenue. The educational reform in which we are engaged, and other social welfare policies and reduction in the structural deficit in fiscal accounts. Second, to improve income distribution and tax equity. Third, to introduce new and more efficient ways of encouraging saving and investment. And fourth, to implement measures to decrease tax evasion and loopholes. Is that the word? Loopholes. 
I know that one aspect of this tax reform will be of interest to you. The repeal of Law 600 concerning the foreign investment statute, new investment projects, and a tax invariability clause. This legislation was adopted in 1974 in a very different political, social, and economic context when there was a dictatorship in Chile and our international prestige was at a very low level. The lack of democracy, lack of freedom, and unreliability of our institution meant that mechanisms such as this were needed in order to encourage foreigners to invest. After 25 years of democracy, with our solid international prestige, in a context of good governance, democracy, and freedom, we no longer need this mechanism to make foreign invest investors look favorably on the idea of investing in our country. The institutional stability of our countries enable us to take the decision to continue this mechanism without affecting foreign investment in Chile. I should like to share some pictures, uh, sorry, features with you. It would have been nice that I brought some pictures, but I didn't bring some pictures. <laughs> Chile has trade agreements with 61 countries. These countries account for 63% of the world's population and 85% of global GDP. In addition, Chile ranks 34th out of 144 economies in the World Bank's Doing Business Index. As regards to Chile as a place for doing business, I should like to say that in 2013, our country was among the first 20 economies receiving foreign direct investment. It ranked 18th, according to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Our foreign policy has also, well, I don't know if I changed, but we, we are also trying to do other, I mean, to have new emphasis, new focuses, and we are looking at Latin America and the Caribbean as a very important option. Latin America is our natural space, and from there we shall reach out to the world. We realize that it is a diverse region, but we must respect the different paths to development. Differences are not obstacles for convergences. We believe that Chile can help to build bridges of understanding over and above differences of approach, and that, as I have noted on so many occasions, the region presents the most united face possible to the world. This vision precisely explains our conception of the Pacific Alliance, an economic integration project that does not preclude or oppose other integration schemes. A few days ago in Mexico, I reaffirmed our commitment to the Pacific Alliance. Similarly, we have promoted convergence and dialogue between the Pacific Alliance and the Mercosur countries without watering down the alliance's specificity or its rates of progress. We shall pay special attention to Latin America, and we shall continue to develop our excellent political, economic, and cultural relation with our partners in Europe, Asia Pacific, and particularly our relation with the United States are characterized by their solidity, trust, and maturity, reflecting important shared principles, values, and interests. We believe in the strength and relevance of democracy and the rule of law. And we defend the rights of individuals and their fundamental freedoms. In addition, we share a common vision of the importance of free trade in ensuring development and stimulating investment. And we're working together to create a multilateral trade system based on clear, predictable, and transparent rules. Chile and the United States must move forward in our relationship. And I'm sure that after this visit, New dimensions and areas of understanding will emerge for a new association focused on scientific and technical cooperation, innovation, energy, and education, among other things. Dear friends, at the outset of this speech, I spoke of the importance of trust in ensuring a country's development. This trust also depends on the continuous enhancement and expansion of democratic rights of the citizens. This is why I have advocated a new constitution. Our existing constitution dates from 1980 and was adopted in conditions which today nobody could describe as democratic. Despite the numerous, the various amendments introduced over the past decade, it still has this sort of deficit origin, if I may use this term. In addition, it contains provision limiting electoral majorities, allowing minorities to tie with majorities. And this is contrary to the one of the basic tenets of any modern state, respect for the voice of the majority and not allowing a few to veto what a nation wants. In addition, this forced tie 
make it, makes it difficult for the country to democratically resolve its differences. A fully democratic social covenant is an essential prerequisite for trust in the institution, trust in the state, and trust in politics. And it is essential to a healthy society in which entrepreneurship flourishes and private initiative has certainty and stability for its action. While we have been laying the foundation for a new constitution, which is necessarily a lengthy process of dialogue and participation, we, are not, we have not remained idle. After more than 20 years of discussion, Chile has abolished a major exclusion. Starting with the next presidential election, Chileans living abroad may, will be able to vote. In addition, we have drafted legislation reforming a binominal electoral system, which in practice allows a tie between majorities and minorities in terms of legislative representation, replacing it with a proportional system providing for higher levels of competition and representativeness, especially for smaller parties, and I should add, trying also to introduce more balance, gender balance, in our parliament. We are very far away from that. We are adopting this course because we are convinced that enhancement of democracy is the key to a more solid society. A society anchored in respect for individuality and difference, but which can guarantees in each person appropriate standards of respect and well-being. And also a society which has legitimate institutional mechanism for resolving its differences. It is in this space of respect and trust that collective projects can evolve, linking individual expectations and initiatives with the great dreams of society. The transformations that I have described here will require time and gradual introduction so they can mature with dialogue and democratic participation and can be anchored durably and legitimately in our society and our institutions so that they can enjoy the support of a sound economy and legitimate institutions. Many of them will last beyond a government term of office because we are thinking about development in the long term. Chile is not a populist country. We know that economic responsibility and democratic legitimacy are the only way to create lasting and equitable well-being for each of its citizens. Dear friends, at the solstice, which occurred last week, the indigenous cultures of Chile celebrate the new year as in the case of many places. It is the beginning of a new cycle of collective work, organization and commitment looking forward to a good harvest. And this is the task on which in this new cycle we have embarked as a society. And like the seasons, it represents no disruption, but the wisdom to recognize the tasks that are fitting for each time. Thus we shall sow a seed of social capital cohesion and well-being with deep roots, which is the basis of all solid and sustainable development. I know that the great task on which Chile has embarked in my term of office will last for several calendars, but it will be a harbinger of spring in all its splendor. And this is the reason for our optimism or, and, of course, our untiring work. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us here at Brookings. It's wonderful to have you here with us. It's, um, uh, we have uh, a few minutes now for uh, opportunity for some discussion. And uh, I'd like to take the moderator's privilege to uh, lead off with asking the first question. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, turn back to some of the foreign policy questions you raised in your speech. Um, uh, as you know, Chile is currently uh, once again serving on the UN Security Council. And it's a time of, of rising global insecurity, tensions in, in Europe, in Asia, in the Middle East. I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about how you envision uh, Chile's role playing out in the Security Council during this term. Uh, well, we, we see ourselves as, uh, always we have seen ourselves as a country who has the respect for the rule of law and uh, respect uh, multilateral institutions and uh, respect a peaceful way of solving uh, uh, problems when it's possible. Of course, it's not usually the kind of things the Security Council has to deal with. Uh, but 
So we will be ensuring that the principles and values that Chile always represent and, 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 and that we share with the United States will be the ones who, uh, every time we have to discuss case to case, will be put there uh, as, as the more important issues. But we also think, uh, and we were talking with President Obama about that, we th I think we need to discuss much more on, on the way we're dealing with conflicts, the way uh, what, um, what, which is the role and the, I mean, and if peacekeeping operation needs more support and needs to see what else we have to do. I mean, my opinion, not only as President of the Republic, but having work in the UN and having, I mean, as Minister of Defense, we sent, uh, I, I really uh, push a lot on Chile's, uh, I would say, a very a active participation on peacekeeping operation. But after being in many countries, visiting many refugee camps, uh, visiting uh, uh, peacekeeping operation sites, I think we need to make a stronger thought and assessment and see what else we can do because I'm not sure we win in the battle and we need to do much more about that. Thank you, President Bachelet. Um, I think we have time uh, to take a few questions from the audience. Uh, if you could uh, please wait for the microphone, uh, raise your hand if you wish uh, to ask a, uh, a question, and if you would identify yourself and your institutional affiliation. While we wait for uh, the, <laughs> the crowd to uh, collect its thoughts, I, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit more about Chile's, uh, your, your government's thoughts on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I know there's been some some doubts that have been raised about the direction of the negotiations, and I'm wondering if you could uh, elaborate on, on, on what direction do you see uh, Chile taking uh, in the negotiations as they go forward? Um, as you may know, this all started with the P4, where Chile was part of it. Mm -hmm. And then we, as with Singapore, Brunei, Dar es Salaam, and uh, New Zealand. And, and looking at the way, because in APEC, uh, all the economies, it has been very difficult to think on the free trade agreement of the whole Asia Pacific area that, and we do believe that is a good idea and we have been pushing towards that. So when we were on the P4, we started inviting many other uh, nations to be part of it. So that's what it came to a P7 and P8 and now it will be, if we use the former um, uh, name, it will be like a P12. So Chile has been part of this very strongly. The thing is that when we are talking about the TPP, uh, we need to see the result has to be uh, better than what we have today because we have already free trade agreements with all the rest of the 11 countries. So what we are uh, negotiating, if I may say, or analyzing, what would it mean in which terms and how we can ensure, uh, I mean, we, we really want a free trade agreement with the highest standard, uh, quality level standards but we need to ensure that those, uh, those standards are also respecting the national interest. So that's the kind of thing. I'm not gonna go into the technicalities. There are some issues we need to discuss further and uh, we, are, we are in that doing so. So we hope uh, we, can, we can be able to get to a good solution for sort of a win-win solution for everyone because we believe that this is really, uh, um, it could be a very important uh, perspective on trade and, and, and economic relation between the 12 countries. Yes, uh, Richard. Uh, uh, Richard Feinberg, uh, Brookings and the University of California, San Diego. Madam President, thank you for your very inspiring and persuasive remarks. Uh, you spoke of Chile as a potential bridge among countries. Uh, in the Western Hemisphere right now, perhaps two of the most difficult problems are the polarization in Venezuela uh, and the issue of change in Cuba. I wondered if you could specifically indicate what role Chile might play as a bridge in those two ongoing problems. Well, I would say, uh, as a matter of fact, we not only envisage, we are, have been doing things about that. Uh, in the case of Venezuela, um, what we have done, and, and during my inauguration uh, days, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs had a meeting with the rest of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of UNASUR, and 
we believe that public statements are good but are not sufficient. So instead of having a big public statement, we thought it would be better to put people in action. So we decided to send a mission of foreign ministers to Venezuela. And it was, I would say, at the beginning pretty successful because it permitted, for the first time, government and opposition get together, sit together, and talk and dialogue. And there has been other visits with different and some, some progress made. And the last time, I believe, progress a little bit slow. But the only thing that I believe is we don't, and we know it's, it's not easy. It's a very polarized society, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. But we have had in the past, when I was president of UNASUR, for temporary, because presidents, uh, uh, every year is a new president of UNASUR. We had a, a, a situation in Bolivia and uh, I personally handle it, and we could avoid to get into a worse possibility. So we truly believe that through dialogue, but probably we need to make bigger efforts so we can see a solution. That, I have to be, say, is the Venezuelans who have to solve their internal issues, and what we need to do is to support them to, to, with the Vatican, the Vatican is also part of this uh, process, to support all the process of uh, dialogue and hopefully uh, a peaceful solution to the internal conflict. In the case, uh, we are also very active in the case of Colombia and the relationship with the FARC and now with the ALN that the government started the negotiations to. We have been very helpful in that too and that as President Santos has recognized us and we'll be continuing looking forward to support all the um, all the efforts that President Santos is doing to bring peace into Colombia. And in the case of Cuba, of course, we will always be able to build in bridges. Uh, we haven't had yet any visit to Cuba or something like that, but uh, we are looking forward if we can do any process and supporting uh, whatever is needed, we will, we will be there. We have a question here regarding um, uh, the set, uh, the indigenous communities of Chile, and uh, what your pol the policies in your government uh, do you foresee in terms of uh, their uh, role in Chile and uh, the question of land, that I understand is, is one of the issues that's at hand. Yeah, he was asking about the indigenous <laughs> communities in Chile. But the important thing is that I heard the question. <laughs> so I can answer it, isn't it? No, well, uh, the thing is that um, we have said that we need to, uh, let me see, sort of a new pact, a new, new pact with, with, the, with, with the indigenous communities because we do have historic political depth, if I may say, with them. Uh, so we have a whole agenda of different things from uh, ensuring political participation of the indigenous group, but also uh, economic development, all the land and so on, uh, cultural uh, measures, et cetera, et cetera, so they can really be integrated, but within their own specificities, diversity of their own culture. Chile can be a multicultural country, and we have many different uh, indigenous groups. It's not only one. Uh, we have from the north, I Aymaras to the Kawaskar and Yamanas in the, in the south, and of course Rapa Nui and Mapuches and, and, and the Aguitas and Koyas and Quechuas, etc. So we need to, uh, and, and so it's very important that we have a, a, a whole agenda that will, that has been worked with them too, but also what we have been doing, and it's very important, I believe, um, and we were talking about social permits it's also linked to that, is that we have, we have approved, as a country, we have ratified the Convention 169 of ILO. And in that convention, it states that all kinds of projects, administrative, politic, political, or economic projects that affect directly the communities should go to consultation with the communities. So for example, I, I have in my program a Ministry of Indigenous uh, um, affairs, 
uh, an agenda, uh, a, a council of uh, indigenous people. Uh, I have the Ministry of Culture and so on, and, but I, I didn't send those projects to the parliament until we do the right process of consultation. And, and, and that should be in many other situations, they should be part of, uh, at least it's in a consultative way, to be part of giving their opinion on what and how do they feel and what we would like in some issues or institutions that will represent them. So I would say it's a new way of doing things on one hand, but also in a very active agenda dealing with the, uh, I would say shortcomings that we have had with them and some challenges that we have had. And I know that we will be able to, in that sense, also to diminish some conflicts that we have in some part of the country. And also with a lot of social protection because in many of, of the indigenous areas, we are the places we have higher rates of poverty or higher rates of some diseases and that it's linked with poverty. So we need to, I would say, pay more attention on them, but with respect to their own uh, values and, and, and culture. Thank you very much, President Bachelet. I'm afraid that we've come to the end of our time. Thank you for being so generous and sharing I'm it so with sorry. us. I'm so sorry, I spoke and too much. <laughs> no. Thank you, please join me in thanking President Bachelet, but I would also like to ask the audience if you could please remain seated until President Bachelet and the members of her delegation that are accompanying her to her next meeting have a chance to uh, clear the building so that we can try to keep you on schedule. Thank you very much.